is prediabetes real? And does it put you at risk for other complications like diabetes? We're going to answer these questions and more with a clinical endocrinologist and diabetes expert, Dr. Jan Pang. All right. Welcome, Dr. Pang. Glad you could be with us today. Thank you for having me. Of course. Dr. Pang, fact or fiction? Pre-diabetes is not real. It's just a label that was made to scare people. That's a fiction. That's not true. Pre-diabetes is actually an uh, official diagnosis. It's a recognizable condition, and it has its uh, clinical significance. So what exactly is it? Prediabetes is a sugar metabolism disorder, so it's uh, milder than the real diabetes. Before we talk about prediabetes, we actually should talk about pre-what diabetes. So we have three types of diabetes, three major types called type 1, type 2, and gestational diabetes. This prediabetes is really pre-type 2, so it's a milder form, precursor of the uh, type 2 diabetes. Do you think we should label it like we do for diabetes? Yes, definitely. Well, fact or fiction then, one out of a hundred people in this country have prediabetes. One out of a hundred in what country? The Our country? United States. No, we're talking about one third. We're talking about one third of the mm -hmm. population. Yes. A lot of people don't even know they have prediabetes, it's significantly underdiagnosed, but the research really has solid data, it's about one third. Fact or fiction, only overweight and obese people get prediabetes. That's not true. Okay. Uh, a lot of people, because of their sedentary lifestyle, because of their genetics, they have prediabetes. It doesn't have to be uh, related to weight. But you're right, a lot of people who are overweight, this is a, a risk factor for uh, diabetes. Overweight people tend to uh, get prediabetes easily, but you don't have to be overweight. Fact or fiction, prediabetes is just diabetes without the complications. No, that's not true. So uh, prediabetes and diabetes are different diseases. So basically you have prediabetes first and diabetes without complications and then diabetes with complications. So that's different, different stages. Okay. The fact or fiction, A1C, the A1C test is the best way to diagnose prediabetes. Okay, since you're a primary care physician, I would say that's the best one for you because it's really convenient. Uh, in order to diagnose prediabetes, we have three ways, okay? The easiest way is the uh, A1C. You can check A1C when you're not fasting and it can be in the afternoon, but um, we have two other ways that you can diagnose and uh, each way has its own benefit. So one is called fasting glucose you really require people to do a venous sample. It's not a finger prick, so it's a venous sample of blood work, and patient needs to be fasting. The other way is to do a really complicated, is the OGTT, the glucose tolerant test. You need to uh, drink some sugary drink and then wait for two hours and then do a blood work. That's more complicated, but it tells you additional information. And as an endocrinologist who specializes in diabetes and things, how often are you doing this two-hour glucose tolerance test? Honestly, by the time patients come to me, they're already full-blown diabetes, and uh, I think prediabetes is a, more of a concern for primary care physicians to uh, detect and screen. Fact or fiction, prediabetes and diabetes are genetic and cannot be prevented. The development of prediabetes and diabetes are usually multifactorial. One factor is genetics. You cannot change that part. But the others, you can actually change. That's so-called the uh, lifestyle modification. You cannot change your race. You cannot change your mom and dad. You cannot uh, change like the area you live in, and even the uh, social economic status, but you can change your own lifestyle. You can choose to eat healthier. You can choose to uh, manage your weight more aggressively. So I think it can be changed. Um, a lot of things can be changed. 
what are the most important things to to do to prevent prediabetes? In order to prevent prediabetes, we have three things. Weight management, diet, exercise. Among the three, the weight management is pretty much the most important thing, especially nowadays in our country. So factor fiction then, the carnivore diet is the best diet that's going to give you long-term health and prevent diabetes. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, you know, nowadays we do evidence-based medicine and we really need a lot of data to say this is working and this is safe. I myself haven't seen enough data to support uh, the diet to be safe and effective, especially long-term. We need we need um, clinical trials and uh, we need more data. Do you have a favorite diet that you use for uh, prediabetes and di or diabetes? You're asking a nation. So <laughs> my diet is heavily, uh, is, is rice heavy. Uh, so that's not good. I know what is not good. But uh, for the time being, we really recommend Mediterranean diet and use usually high in fiber, high in lean, uh, lean protein, and high in uh, healthy fat, low carb. That's the principles. Since in Asia a lot of rice is eaten and everything, what do you think the difference is in why maybe diabetes is so much worse in the United States? Or... I think you are a little bit outdated oh, yeah? in that data because if you look at the data in yeah. India, they are having a pandemic wow. of diabetes. And in China, because Chinese people are having a lot of like fast food, there's McDonald's and KFC everywhere in China, even Starbucks is everywhere. So uh, people are getting bigger. Um, diabetes is a big issue there. So maybe the, the Western countries have just spread our culture around the world to poison everybody. I can't comment on that. <laughs> I'll say it's true. <laughs> Factor fiction. Hypoglycemia, or low blood sugar, is a common sign of prediabetes. I don't think so. So there, are there any symptoms of prediabetes? Unfortunately, prediabetes are typically asymptomatic. That's actually why a lot of people think that's not even a thing. But it is important to uh, treat prediabetes even is asymptomatic. Well, I think it's time for a bonus question. Oh no, a bonus question. Dr. Peng is gonna kill us. Oh, it's okay. Dr. Peng, can you name the six important structures that come out of the cerebellar punting angle? Oh my goodness. Can I call a friend? <laughs> as long as you don't call me. Okay. I do have your phone numbers. <laughs> the last one. time, the last time I was in medical school, that was uh, 2017, and I was teaching endocrinology, not neuroscience, not anatomy. So I wouldn't know the answer. I'm well, so I had to sorry. Look hard to find that one, and I, I wouldn't know the answer, and, and except for that, I I looked it up right before we. Uh, I'm eager to know the answer. So the cerebellum of, uh, is one of them, the pons okay. is one of them, okay. and then there's three cranial nerves, five, seven, and eight, and then there's a, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So, first year of medical school. First year of medical school. First, yeah. Yeah, PTSD. And then it goes out, uh, goes out the memory right after the test. <laughs> it's crazy. That's always fun. Fact or fiction? Everybody with prediabetes should be on a medicine to treat it and prevent diabetes. That's not true. Most people do not need medicine. Depends on how soon we find out. Um, if it's early enough, you do not need medicine. As a matter of fact, lifestyle modification is more uh, helpful than the uh, medicine. And is that going to reverse prediabetes and prevent diabetes? Depends on your uh, genetics and depends on your uh, effort. So if you really put in a lot of effort and you're lucky enough, I think this is uh, reversible. So fact or fiction, increasing muscle mass helps to prevent prediabetes. That's true. That's really true. 
uh, because the underlying cause of prediabetes is mostly insulin resistance and the muscle is a metabolically active organ. Um, so if you increase your muscle mass, you can be more sensitive to insulin that reduces your insulin resistance. You can reverse the uh, uh, prediabetes. Do you have any particular exercise routines that you recommend to your patients who have diabetes? This is highly individualized, so it depends on people. If you were my patient, because of your busy schedule, I would probably recommend uh, the HIIT, mm -hmm. High Intensity Interval Training, because you're young, you're strong, and you don't She's have time. Really you don't have time to uh, to go to the gym and spend two, three hours. So this is basically uh, 15 minutes at a time and uh, uh, keeps your metabolism high. But for most of my uh, patients who are uh, older, um, they can't really do anything intensive. So I recommend walking and I actually recommend brisk walking. So you need to walk, but walk kind of fast. So I don't, I don't need any hard facts or data, but if Dr. Clerks eats two big chocolate chip cookies, and he's a runner, so how far should he run to try to burn off those two cookies? I object to this question. <laughs> gut feel. No, go ahead. Gut, go ahead. Gut, yeah, feel. gut feel. for. Him. We won't hold you to anything. Let's say an hour at least. Okay. That's no problem for you, right? You like to I'm run. Running. You like to run for an hour. Or you could skip the cookies. It's probably worth it though. <laughs> yeah, I do calculation in my mind all the time. Whenever I have some craving, I just talk myself out of it because I just don't have the time and energy uh, to go to the gym. Fact or fiction, these continuous glucose monitors can be a helpful educational tool for people with prediabetes or diabetes. I'm actually excited. This is a very good question. Um, we're in 2024. Technology is really advanced. We have some uh, uh, CGM, the Continuous Glucose Monitoring System. We call them sensors. They can monitor your sugar every minute, meaning every hour you get 60 readings, every day you get 1400 something readings, it can really help you to understand your body and understand your diet. I usually tell my patients this is a learning tool. You can eat something and you can check your sugar and see before and after. You will see like how this particular food would do to your body and how your body responds to different stuff. So you can correct your own behavior. You don't really need me to tell you what to do. They do it on their own. People using CGM system without using medicine, their hemoglobin A1C goes down by one point. Mm. So that's really significant. You don't even need medicine. Mm. Just changing your behavior because you have this real time feedback. So it's very helpful. Unfortunately, this thing hasn't been approved to be used in pre-diabetes. That just means the insurance wouldn't pay for that. And I think it's nice because usually somebody with pre-diabetes probably doesn't need to wear one 365 days a year. They can wear it for a couple weeks or maybe a month and really learn a lot. Exactly. That's what I do. We call that professional sensor study. We put a sensor on people for two weeks and have them come back in two weeks. We download all the data. We tell them, hey, this is how your body responds to your food and you either change your body or change your diet. Maybe the best diabetes education class ever. Yeah. Fact or fiction. Weight loss is better than some of these supplements you might see people taking like cinnamon or garlic or berberine and things like that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Weight loss is better than diet, uh, exercise alone. Weight loss is better than the uh, metformin alone. Weight loss is better than those supplements. Do you see any role of the supplements? Yes. Actually, to be honest with you, the professional guidelines never put the uh, supplement as first-line therapy. But in reality, in your practice, there are always people who prefer natural therapy. And they're like, I'm not ready for insulin. I'm not ready for metformin. I, I can use berberine. And that's better than nothing. So we've talked a lot about diet and things like that and helping 
pre-diabetes and diabetes. How do you think people should approach social situations where everybody wants to bring the, the high calorie foods and drinks and share them and enjoy life and really maybe to excess? Tips. Usually uh, we're talking about like a birthday party you're offered like with the uh, uh, birthday cakes. I think before going to the uh, social events, probably have a good healthy meal beforehand is important. So you're full, then you can resist the uh, temptation. That's one thing. Another thing would be maybe just focus on the uh, social part. Mm -hmm. Talk to people, enjoy the uh, gathering instead of enjoying the food. You can move yourself away from the uh, food table just to stay away from the food. So fact or fiction, half of pre-diabetes patients will go on to develop diabetes. Every year, basically without intervention, without treatment, 5 to 10 percent um, of people with prediabetes will have diabetes, I mean full-blown diabetes. But by the end of 10 years, we're talking about 70 percent of people with prediabetes. Fact or fiction, prediabetes has the same risk cardiovascularly as diabetes. Actually, same risk but a little less. So if you have prediabetes, your risk for cardiovascular events are increased by 10 to 20 percent. But if you have real diabetes, is way higher, maybe double, maybe triple. All right, so we're going to ask you just a little non-clinical type thing. I know that you uh, were a research doctor at Harvard, spent some time up in the Northeast, and even did your training at uh, Dartmouth and taught medical students there. Tell us something interesting about just the New England area that everybody should know. One thing I remember was I got much better triceps, biceps, and deltoid, okay. shoveling snow oh. for like about seven months. Okay, so it's yeah. a great place to in, snow then. <laughs> in New ever, Hampshire. Have you ever shoveled snow? Okay. So. Yeah, I didn't have a, I didn't have a garage, so my car, I had to like shovel my car out. That was uh, New Hampshire, and I remember in 2016, at one night, the temperature dropped to minus 20. It was really cool. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Pang, as a diabetes expert, I have to ask you this: Twix, Snickers, Three Musketeers, Butterfingers. What is the healthiest candy bar? <laughs> Are you serious? We need to know this. this okay. Cool. The only thing that I know is they are all candy bars. And I've never <laughs> tried one. Um, You've never I've had a candy bar? I don't think so. Well, I have a follow-up question then. When you dress up for Halloween or and going from door to door, what do you ask for with your trick-or-treat basket? Oh, I basically follow my son when he did that. I was too old for that myself. So when my son um, collect all the candies, I took them away. <laughs> Dr. Peng, thank you so much for coming on our show today and for answering our questions about prediabetes. It's been a pleasure and we hope that you can come back again and talk to us about some more topics. Thank you so much. You guys really ask good questions. Thank you. And for you guys, maybe you haven't seen it, but we have a video where we look at mine and Dr. Frick's blood sugar and uh, learn some exciting things. So check it out.